everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. All right, let's get started with our program. Um, our first speaker today is Judy Eitzen. And she is a volunteer at the historic Rose Garden at the Sacramento Cemetery. And she's going to talk to us about the cemetery and the roses that are grown there, how to grow them, and then basically the development of the of the, the the garden there. So, Jude. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, change programs here because this is just a little what my friend Barbara Oliva likes to call rose pornography. And I prefer to call eye candy, but <laughs> it's a little nicer. Let's see. I need to open the other. Peter likes to tell me what he writes in, uh, as he said, and uh, I am a volunteer at the Historic City Cemetery's Rose Garden, the Historic Rose Garden, where we focus on um, roses that we locate uh, around the state, and our focus is on history. First, let me give you a brief uh, in information about myself. I'm a retired librarian, which means, and I was born in September. Now that means that I am one of those people, oh, thank you. Uh, that means that I'm one of those people who likes to over-organize and to make sure everything is, all my ducks are in a row, my I's are dotted and my T's are crossed. And so uh, I get involved in such things as the newsletter, um, for our garden and uh, <clears throat> arranging for speakers for the master gardeners and those kinds of things that I can do sitting at my computer, which I love to do when I'm not gardening. Uh, <clears throat> the Historic City Cemetery in Sacramento was founded in 1850. We'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, and we tend, we try really hard to focus on the historical aspect of these roses that we've collected over the years. And so that's what this program is gonna talk about a little bit. The Historic City Cemetery was founded in 1850 on 10 acres donated by Captain John Sutter. If you are interested in California history, and I like to say I'm interested in California history, I'm a sixth generation Californian, which is pretty rare in, in today's, uh, today's state. And so I am interested in California history in the sense that I like to know how my family got here, what they did every day, how did they grow their food, how did they uh, handle gardens, and so forth. I have um, ancestors who were gardeners. In fact, my grandmother ran a small nursery in San Francisco in the 1920s. So I come by it naturally, I think. In 1850, he donated 10 acres for the purposes of burying uh, uh, victims of a cholera epidemic in 1850 and 51, and they needed a place fast. And uh, there are two pieces of high ground in Sacramento, high being a relative term. That is to say they were about 18 feet above the flood stage of the river. And he built Sutter's Fort on one of them, and he uh, owned the, uh, the other property which he donated to the city for the purposes of his cemetery. Captain Sutter was a brilliant man in many ways, in terms of uh, being able to farm and grow wonderful and exciting things. He recognized immediately the importance of the valley in terms of agriculture. But he was a poor businessman and he kept going broke because he would plant a crop and he would lose it because he went off to fight a war or because it was flooded out or because something else happened uh, to, uh, to kill his crop. So he needed money. And as a result, he asked his son to come out and help him manage his money at which point the son began selling parts of the original Mexican land grant, which eventually became the city of Sa Sacramento. If you look at the map, and we will in a moment, you'll see the grid of streets, and I can show you a little bit about that. Uh, the plots in the cemetery were sold like real estate. You have a deed, in fact, I have a deed to a, a cemetery plot in Vallejo that was sold in about 1910, and uh, which gives me the right to do anything on that property uh, with regards to burying or cremains or any of that sort of thing, erecting headstones. I can't operate a business or build a house, but I do own that property. Uh, it was, the cemetery was unfortunately neglected for well over 40 years, uh, it, from about 1920 to about 1970, and or give or take, until some volunteers began uh, to get together um, to restore uh, the cemetery. It was planned as a garden cemetery, and so that was the focus was to head toward that 
kind of a goal. This is what Sacramento looked like in about 1850. Uh, this is looking from the west to the east uh, at the waterfront. That's J Street or K Street. I'm never sure which. Um, and this is so typical. If you were in Sacramento today, this building is still there. This building is still there. And there is still a riverboat parked in exactly the same spot. The Delta King is parked there now. The old, old Sacramento has been restored and is now maintained as a state park uh, in conjunction with the city of Sacramento. And then, of course, the State Railroad Museum is there as well. But it does look a lot like this, especially on uh, gold rush days, which is Labor Day weekend. They put dirt back in the streets, and it looks just like this. Remind me to tell you about my ghostly experience there one day. Moving right along, uh, Sacramento's biggest problem uh, in the early days was that it continued to flood. This is the one in 1862. This is an etching from the Sacramento Union and showing uh, the rowboats so that people used to get around. In fact, um, there is one person who recorded in his diary that he rented a house and it had a rowboat in the basement just in case. The cemetery was designed originally as a Victorian cemetery, as a garden or rural cemetery after some of the early uh, garden cemeteries like Mount Auburn in the east. City parks didn't exist then. The concept of a public park wasn't really a concept. And people went to the cemetery um, on Sunday morning uh, after church. They went to, took the picnic lunch and cleaned grandma's grave and had a nice little picnic. And this was the place to get into a, a country area when you were in the middle of the city. So we put what we refer to as found roses in a beautiful setting. These are roses that we locate on sites throughout California, abandoned cemeteries, abandoned properties, old farms, usually with permission of the owner, but sometimes we rustle these roses without permission. Uh, these are pr primarily roses that were available to 19th century rose growers. Uh, many people brought things west with them. And as a former librarian, one of the things that always fascinated me was two things are real easy to transport when you're on a Conestoga wagon. One is bare root roses, or some other perennials as well, but roses travel particularly well. And the other are books. And the kinds of books that they brought were Bibles, especially family Bibles, and they brought uh, primers to teach their children, and then other books that had to do with how to do things, how to build a wagon, how to grow a garden, and so forth. But roses came across the country, and many of them were planted in, in grandma's doorway as she built the cabin out here in California. Some of those roses survived without care. We also plant roses that... Uh, uh, were important in the development of some of the modern roses, uh, roses that are antecedents of some of the roses that are grown today uh, by most gardeners. This is an early view of the cemetery. This is from the Sacramento Bee, circa 1860. And it shows kind of an open rural setting with very small trees and so forth. Sacramento is a riparian area. The valley oaks and the blue oaks are native to the area, but there aren't many other big trees at that time. and. Uh, the cemetery was very informal and casual. In terms of cemeteries, it was egalitarian as well, because if you were Catholic, you were buried at the cemetery about a half a mile down Broadway. But if you were anything else, everything from Native American, African American, Hindu, uh, Christian, Jew, everybody, you were buried in this cemetery and more or less side by side. Uh, you, if you could afford it, you could buy a plot, and it didn't matter where it was, you bought it. Uh, the most expensive plots were on the highest ground. Um, the cheapest plots were, were simple slots, like what we refer to as tiers, where the burials are side by side by side. Some of the plots are 10 by 10, some are 20 by 20, and some are even bigger than that. Our most uh, prominent resident is uh, Mark Hopkins of the Big Four uh, Railroad, you know, Stanford, Hopkins, Charles Crocker, and uh, Collis Huntington were the movers and shakers behind the uh, Central Pacific Railway, uh, along with uh, Charles's brother, Edwin, um, who was the treasurer and eventually the largest stockholder before it finally got sold to Southern Pacific uh, some years later. Uh, so Mark Hopkins is buried in our cemetery. His wife is not. 
His wife preferred San Francisco society, and he preferred the rough and tumble town of Sacramento, so he's buried there. Um, other prominent residents um, include uh, the son of Alexander Hamilton, three governors, about a dozen mayors of Sacramento, and oddly enough, and this is the one that fascinates me, Wyatt Earp's nephew and one of Ike Clanton's daughters-in-law. So you see, even the gunfight at the OK Corral came to California. This is an early funeral display. The young ladies are all in white. That was typical if you were a, a young unmarried woman or a young girl, you wore white. Uh, the funeral displays here are of flowers that many of which probably came from the Bells Conservatory, which was located across the street uh, uh, from the cemetery. It's gone now, unfortunately. Uh, if you look to the right top corner of this photo, you'll see a row of elm trees, all with their, uh, their, their trunks painted white. Those elm trees were planted in the 1870s, and many of them are still in existence, although they're dying one by one and being removed. Uh, they're about half the size in this photo as they are now. This is the confluence of the Sacramento River and the American River. And you see the green at the American River. This is probably one of the largest uh, protected parkways along a river in an urban setting in the United States. It goes all the way to Folsom Dam. Uh, the squares here that you see is the main part of the original city of Sacramento. The streets are numbered 1 through 29 or 30, and the, and the uh, alternate streets are alphabetical A through Z. Uh, the cemetery is located, oh, let me do a little digression. For those of you who are really interested in history, uh, when John Setter Jr. hired the Army Corps of Engineers to lay out the city of Sacramento, one of the members of that team was a young Army lieutenant whose name was William Tecumseh Sherman. He later went on to fame in another area, but for us, his fame has to do with laying engineers laying out the streets of the city. The historic city cemetery, now the camera's dropped down just a little, I love Google Earth. The camera has dropped down just a little bit and that little push pin is where the cemetery is. And you can see here that the cemetery is the area where the pin is. The area to the left that's kind of green is World War II housing, which is still extant. Uh, and there's lots of trees in there and hence it's, a, it's pretty green. But the cemetery is this long green area. It consists of about 40-odd acres of three cemeteries, a city cemetery, a Masonic cemetery, and an Odd Fellows cemetery. The big white thing over on the right is the Target store that's close by there. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. It used to be the Sacramento Solon Stadium was right there. This is Highway 50 across the top here. So let's take a look at the cemetery today. After people have been working for more than 30 years trying to put it back together and make it look wonderful, we have uh, reestablished the rural character of the cemetery. A lot of the trees that were planted in the 19th century are now large uh, and uh, provide a very nice ambiance. You can see a bench, a couple of benches in this photo. Again, we do try to maintain benches and picnic tables in the cemetery to maintain its rural cemetery character. If you bought a plot, you could do whatever you chose in terms of building the surround or the structures within the plot. A lot of people used brick, other people used cement or granite to finish off their plots. This is another view of a different section in the cemetery where there's a brick walkway. There's lots of really interesting headstones. And as a retired librarian, I love this headstone. I thought this was really cool until I discovered it was the headstone of a lawyer. <laughs> so much for that. There's some other interesting things I didn't know about burials and cemeteries and city cemeteries. Uh, funeral parlors are required, at least in, in Sacramento County they were, required by law to perform some bo pro bono burials. Uh, from the county hospital uh, where indigents were born and died. In this case, this was a baby that lived just a couple of days uh, in 1940. And very often what they would do is put a flat cement stone, um, and, and this one just had baby J.L. Corey Jr. I'm not even sure that uh, they knew for sure uh, who the parents were or anything. It did have a name, so this is unusual. 
Born October 6, 19, October 8, 1940, died October 10th, 1940. So uh, the, the funeral uh, parlor would either uh, cremate or bury uh, either the remains or the cremains in a plot and put one of these little flat cement markers. We discovered this one when we were digging out a, a rose that had crown gall and we needed to remove it. And it was buried about six or eight inches down and we didn't know it was there. When we turned it over, we found on the back the newspaper that was used to wet down the cement when the mold was made and you could still read it because it had been buried underground. It was really kind of interesting. Some of the headstones have historical importance and we focus on those when we give uh, tours. For, for example, at the end of October, we're giving lantern tours. Uh, a lot of people refer to them as ghost tours, but we don't tell ghost stories. We tell stories about people buried in the cemetery who perhaps were murdered or some other, you know. <laughs> well, we have those too, or, or perhaps some other creepy stories. We tell all kinds of interesting stories about the people who who are our permanent residents. This particular headstone has a shovel in front of it because we finally got, this is in the Rose Garden, we finally got water to this plot and this is Anthony Preston Smith's headstone. He happens to be buried in the Rose Garden. He was one of the earliest nurserymen in the Sacramento Valley. He had a nursery along the American River where he specialized in fruit trees and roses. And so it's really appropriate that he is planted here himself. And we are going to plant some of the roses that he sold in that plot. Some of the headstones and monuments are beautiful. This monument is on top of a, uh, this young girl sits on top of a monument that's about five feet high and she's almost five feet high. So it's a big uh, piece in the cemetery. Many of them have 19th century uh, funerary designs and um, uh, she's carrying a wreath, she's looking sad. Uh, they, there are things with urns with blankets on top and all kinds of things I don't even pretend to understand. But it is really an interesting cemetery just in terms of the headstones. There are three gardens in the um, cemetery, three formal gardens. Uh, one of the things that we do is we give tours to people. This is a historic tour given to a group of travel teens. And I don't know if you're familiar with that program, but travel teens is a program that brings teenagers around the state to uh, different historic places. They come to Sacramento from Los Angeles and Ventura County. And they have money in the school districts down there, apparently. And uh, they tour the state capitol and uh, the railroad museum and, of course, the cemetery. And we give them a historic tour. We have rose garden tours um, during our open garden event as well. This is the back of Barbara Oliva giving a tour a year or so ago. There is a perennial garden in Hamilton Square. Hamilton Square was named for the son of Alexander Hamilton, who's buried in that area. And this particular garden is a modern perennials, and there are some modern roses there. You'll be happy to hear that. And um, it is sponsored by the local uh, Sacramento Perennial Plant Club. Flanders poppies, which are historically appropriate. Again, the plants are appropriate for a Mediterranean climate and in many cases have historical significance of one kind or another. There is also a native plant demonstration garden, which is sponsored by the Sacramento chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Uh, these are some of the poppies, uh, which we have managed to reseed into the rose garden as well, uh, as along with others. And then the third garden, of course, is our very own special, personal, and private, no, it's open to the public, <laughs> rose garden. We love this garden. For those who really care, uh, the rose on the right is, uh, anybody? Climbing American Beauty. Yeah, it's a once bloomer. Um, and the rose on the right has since been removed because it had crown gall. We've replanted it. So it's not quite as pretty right now, but next year maybe. Now in the cemetery itself, this is the section that is the rose garden. It's about two and a half acres. And if you look at the squares at the top here, those are 10 by 10 feet. The ones in this section are all 20 by 20. Those are the plots where the burials take place. And you can, even, this is Google Earth again, you can see some of the individual roses, which is really cool. It's the most amazing thing. I could even see the truck parked in my driveway. Yeah. Yes, the oldest part of the cemetery is that, that, that acreage right up there next to Broadway. In fact, in 1947-48, they widened Broadway, and a lot of individual burials had to be moved 
uh, because they took some of the cemetery property. I don't know how they do that, and I really don't want the details. Uh, <laughs> Here in the historic Rose Garden, then, let's take a look. Uh, in uh, 19, get the year right, 1992, they started planting roses in this garden. This is the, a photo that was taken that day of uh, some of the individuals planting, and you can see that the roses, this is the Broadway bed area, the closest to Broadway, and you can see the roses are really rather small. Uh, at, at that initial planting. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of photos of the first couple of years of this garden. They come later. But after they cleared weeds out, which were higher than my head, this is what remained. And there was a lot of vandalism, a lot of damage over the years in the cemetery. And so gradually we are repairing all of these surrounds, partly uh, because of, for aesthetic purposes, but partly because they're not safe. And you know, you have someone walking through there, you can fall down and hurt yourself. So uh, not only does it look bad, it's not safe. And so we worked really hard trying to replace some of these. Uh, one of the things that we do in the Rose Garden is that we do not use herbicides or pesticides. Uh, we do not spray for disease. We do not do any of that. So we have to find uh, other ways to make sure that our roses stay healthy. And one of the things we do, or we tried it to begin with, is using uh, weed cloth and then mulch over the weed cloth. In this case, the weed cloth was added after the roses had been planted. And you notice that, that, that there's a little flat stone that we had to cut the cloth out around. One of the rules that we have is that we can't hide a stone behind a rose. We, everything historical has to be visible. So we very often end up pruning a rose in a way we might not if it weren't for the headstone in that space. So we're pretty careful what we plant where. We have since switched to cardboard mulch underneath the mulch that we, underneath the, uh, uh, the bark that we use. And um, this year we're probably not gonna use so much shredded bark because the city gives it to us, but they shred everything, weeds included. And um, we're purchasing compost this year um, to sort of neaten things up a little bit. Hopefully we can get ahead of it. We have sheriff's work crews. Uh, I don't know if your counties you live in do this, but in Sacramento County, uh, if you are convicted of certain kinds of crimes, you can pay 20 bucks and spend that day working instead of spending all week in jail. And these guys will work on Saturday and Sunday, and it allows them to stay home with their families and keep their jobs, and very often there are people who don't repeat. Um, it doesn't always work, but they do a lot of work. They schlep a lot of stuff. They clean our walkways and move a lot of mulch and do some of the heavy work. There are also some folks with, uh, that are in the sheriff's work crews that have training in areas like uh, wrought iron or brickwork, and they do work on some of the structures in the cemetery. We use a variety of different kinds of structures to around our roses. This particular rose is a Banksia relative, and this structure, I'm showing you a close-up of it so you can see. It stands on the ground. It's not attached into the ground. It stands on the ground and it's bolted together so that if we should need to change its height or its width, we can do so relatively easily. I'm going to show you a picture again of the whole structure with Anita Clevenger, who's about my height, standing next to it so you can see the size and shape of this particular rose. This is a found rose we still haven't identified called Vina Banksa, Banks. And it was found up near Vina, where that's where it got its name. And uh, it has a lovely natural vase shape. And we help it to keep in this shape so that it'll stay out of the aisles and away from the headstones. The city uh, staff uh, who work in the cemetery have been uh, instrumental in putting up a number of structures for some of our climbing roses. Uh, very often, uh, the structures are, uh, in this case, they came from an old wrought iron fence from a piece of property that was abandoned, which was really pretty good because it is historically appropriate for the cemetery. On the other hand, after about six months, you can't see the structure at all. Now, Bev, who is standing underneath there, is about five feet six. And uh, her head is, well, that, that white thing is, a, is a, a sweater tied around her waist. So you can see that she's quite a bit taller. And this is uh, Mademoiselle Cecile Bruner. And uh, it didn't take long to uh, cover that structure. This was one season. 
Now, this rose is uh, uh, Buff Beauty, which is one of my personal favorites. Uh, and you can see here how that lovely cane is arching right in front of that headstone. It looks like it was picture perfect. But of course, we had to put a structure up to get it off that headstone because we can't hide the headstones. So this one had to be cut back. Some of the aisles, we have um, uh, wrought, um, I'm sorry, what is it? Um, Rebar. Uh, rebar we use for some of our uh, structures. Uh, in the case here, these are rebars uh, that cross over the path. There's two 20-foot sections, and they cross in the middle. And uh, they've held for more than 20 years, so they're really good. This is another structure that the city put in for us with a lovely rose on it. Here's one of the rebar structures. You can see it. Um, we use um, electrical conduit, stick it in the ground, stick the rebar down two feet in the electrical conduit, tie it across the top, and cross it in the middle, and you end up with a structure that, as long as the rose isn't too vigorous or too heavy, it will last you for 20 or 30 years. Some of ours are 18 years old now. So let's take a look at some of the roses that we grow. There are still uh, it depends on who you ask, uh, which experts you ask, but there are about 200 species roses that are still uh, found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, most of us know that roses that are grown in places like South Africa and Australia and so forth were brought there. They're not na native south of the equator. I have never known why, and I haven't really researched it, but it has always been fascinating to me that the oldest fossil of a rose, anyone care to guess how old? Oh, come on, you all know this. 35 million, that's absolutely right. And it was found in North America, which is pretty cool. There are wild roses that grow in sites ranging from riparian to swampy to desert to mountains to almost any place. Roses are amazing. Of course, you all know that. We have an identification project that we've uh, been conducting for about five years now. Uh, we are trying to record the botanical details of all the found roses in the cemetery. When we find a rose, we grow it out and see if we can figure out what it is. If we discover that it's something, then we name it whatever it is we agree that it is. We don't rely on just ourselves for that identification. We rely on a, a number of uh, antique rosarians who are uh, really familiar with... <sighs> I, I didn't say that right, did I? <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Ro uh, experts in the antique rose field. How's that? Does that <laughs> sound a little better? <laughs> I walked into that one. Uh, and people like Greg Lowry from Vintage Gardens and um, Michael, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Malcolm Manners from the uh, University of or Southern Florida College and others who are really familiar with with these roses have walked through our cemetery and said, oh, that is such and such, or this is thus and so. And um, if most of them agree, then we will rename the rose, uh, whatever the, the name happens to be from the 19th century or early 20th century. We collect sample photographs at various times of the year so that we have pictures of blossoms, hips, leaves, uh, structure of the plant, everything we can think of. And we share this information among, I shouldn't say antique rosarians, should I? I've got to rephrase this. <laughs> but we share the information among ourselves. How's that? Uh, we began in October of 2004, and we haven't finished. This is the typical, the kind of photograph that we take. Uh, this particular rose is called Cerise Cup. You see the name of the rose is on this photo, as is 529, stands for the plot number. NW means northwest, so it's in the northwest corner of that plot, so we know where the rose is. The name that we give, the study name or the found name that we give to these roses is usually something that's related to where it was found and the type of rose it is, such as uh, Dr. Peck's 12th Avenue Smoothie. Now, that's a rose that was found on 12th Avenue in Oakland a number of years ago. It's never been identified, and I'm not sure where the smoothie comes from. Uh, but then there's another rose that was found up on the Mendocino coast. It's called Mendocino uh, number one. <laughs> so you never know. Uh, but very often we try to add hybrid perpetual or Gallica or some other designation so that we know that, yeah, we're pretty much sure this is what kind of rose it is. Cerise cup, we still don't know. 
And one of the things that we do is to take these kinds of identifying photos so that we can compare all sorts of details about the rows. There is a measuring device across the bottom of the, of the page so that you get an idea of the size of everything. This is one we were looking at uh, this last spring. This is a rose called the Pearl. And I took a photo of the buds on the plant showing a, a blossom that's half open and then the surrounding buds. I also took a picture of the rose we were comparing it to, which is a rose that I showed you earlier with the structure called Vina Banks. Now, we know both of these are connected somehow to Banksia roses, but are they the same rose? And we began to look at them in great detail, trying to figure out exactly uh, what the differences and the similarities are. Some people were, are, we have, we have two groups of rose identifiers. We have, let's see, how shall I put it? We have the lumpers, <laughs> and then we have uh, the splitters. And the lumpers are the people who think if it looks like a Banksia rose, it's a Banksia rose. The splitters are the, are, the, are the ones who say it looks like a Banksia rose, but its buds are a different color. Those are the splitters. So we have two groups of people, and those two groups of people were looking at this rose this spring. The conversation was fascinating. Again, we take photos and compare. Again, on the left is the pearl blossom uh, and uh, showing with some of the leaves and the vina blossom. The, what, the conclusion we came to with this particular pair is that they are both very closely, as you can see, related to Banksia roses. And, um, but they're different from the, the commonly Lady Banksia roses. Rosa Banksias, and they are different from each other very slightly. They're obviously very closely related. The primary difference is in the shape of the blossom um, when it first opens, and the other difference is the, the, the space between the nodes on the stems, which doesn't show very well in this picture, but it is different on the two roses. And they bloom once a year. So one of the other things we try to do is to record stories. Now, this is a particular fence post located in front of a ranch up uh, near Chico, uh, in Moorhead Ranch. And when this rose was found, it was uh, uh, cuttings were taken with permission of the owner. And we called it the Moorhead Complicata because it's a complicata type rose. And uh, we gave it that study name. We planted it in the cemetery and we figured out over about two years that it is really a rose called Ramona, which was very popular in the 19th century. We keep records of both names and we cross-reference them so that if you come to the cemetery and you're looking for, oh, I saw this Moorhead Complicata a couple of years ago, where'd it go? Well, we now keep a record of both names and make sure that you can find out uh, what that rose is. This is the rose planted in the cemetery on a fence. It's absolutely beautiful. Has wonderful blossoms. It blooms all season, which is really kind of neat. And uh, we're very happy we have it now because we didn't have that particular rose before. Roses uh, come to us, especially the early ones, uh, with, from two geographical groupings. And it's very important um, to those of us who collect antique or old garden roses because we need to know the characteristics of how those roses grow so that we can, we can grow them all. And the people in the 19th century grew both. The European roses are Gallicas, Albas, Damasks, Cenifolias. You've heard these names before. I won't repeat them. Generally speaking, they bloom once a season, just like camellias or azaleas uh, or any of the other uh, perennial plants that we plant. Um, sometimes there's a repeat in the fall. In the case of autumn damask, for example, there's a small repeat in the fall. But in, for the most part, they generally bloom once a season. Sometimes that season is very long. Some of them bloom for three weeks. Others will bloom for three months. Um, they have been recorded as being hybridized and planted and grown for various reasons since uh, ancient times. The Oriental and Asian roses, however, are slightly different. These are the Chinas and the Teas. Uh, they come to us from uh, Asia, and the part of Asia I'm referring to is usually China, Korea, or Japan, most of these roses. Some of them from northern India, some of them from Indonesia, or um, eastern Turkey, that area, Turkestan, uh, countries that don't exist anymore in the same way. Uh, generally speaking, these roses bloom continuously throughout the season in flushes or even just constantly. 
and they are somewhat less hardy than the European types. So it was obvious to all the hybridizers in Europe in the 18th and 19th century, when the Asian roses began showing up in Europe, that the best thing to do would be to cross these two types and you would get the best of both. So let's take a look at some of the roses that they used. Um, species roses, these are the roses that breed true out in the field all by themselves. Roses are sexually profligate. There's no other way to put it. And you know they're always hooking up with other roses, and so you end up with all sorts of interesting things. And some of the roses that we consider species are actually hybrids, natural hybrids, uh, that occur out in the field. But for the most part, species roses have just five petals. They're single flowers with five petals. Uh, they're deep red or pink, and some of them are apple blossom. A few are white. Uh, but the rose on the right is typical. They have uh, seven to nine leaflets, more than most roses. Most roses have five to seven, but these guys have seven to nine for the most part. Um, and we grow probably a dozen different species roses in the cemetery. Some of them are really cool. If you come in the cemetery first thing in the morning and there's been dew on the ground, you can smell Rosa Eglantine from 50 feet away. That apple blossom scent comes off of their foliage. Ah, it's to die for. You can see which roses I really like. There are two popular types of roses that are grown by gardeners these days, and these are the old garden roses, also known as antique roses, also known as um, heritage roses, and or anything else you want to call them, the old guys. Uh, most are densely, or many are densely petaled. Shape, the, the shape of the blossom is like a cup, a disc, or a pom pom. Generally speaking, they're flat across the top. Um, they are mostly strongly scented. There's a reason for that. And they are, in effect, living specimens of history. I have a rose growing in my garden. It is a clone of a clone of a whatever number of clones. That was one that was grown by Empress Josephine. That's pretty cool. It's like having a piece of history in your garden. Now, whether it really is or not, I don't know, but I like to think of it that way. And then there's the modern roses. Generally speaking, uh, the, the modern rose era starts with the, the development of the hybrid tea. The first hybrid tea that was commercially offered was 1867, which is not so modern anymore. Uh, but uh, it became the dominant rose of the 20th century, the way hybrid perpetuals had been the dominant rose of the 19th century. Um, these roses, modern roses, generally hold blooms of increasing size on sturdy canes. Uh, they have high centers, and uh, they, they bloom very slowly. They open very slowly, not like overnight. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this, but one of the things that was happening was that, that rose growers were beginning to show roses in the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, and they wanted roses that would stand up to a two-day show or that would stand up in a vase. Uh, tea roses do this. And that's lovely on the plant, but not so good when you're showing a rose. And so, um, and the hybrid perpetuals weren't really perpetual. Uh, so uh, various uh, hybridizers bred roses specifically to have strong, sturdy canes with upright blossoms that would look great uh, when shown. The problem was, of course, they bred out two things that the old garden roses tend to have, and one of them is disease resistance, and the other is scent. Rose Hybridizers are now breeding those things back into the roses. So some of the newest ones are really amazing. Old garden roses, AKA antique roses, AKA historic roses. These are the ones that we grow in the historic city cemetery, all these different types, plus a few modern ones. Let's take a look at the Gallicas. The Gallicas are some of the oldest uh, uh, cultivated roses in Europe. Um, this uh, Gallica cameo is a striped rose. It's difficult to see, but it's pink and white, uh, and there many of them are striped. Um, they come primarily from southern Europe, France, and northern Italy, and along that way. Um, they're hardy, once flowering, compact shrubs. They don't get really big. They don't do that great in, uh, in pardon me, in California. It's not really cold enough, um, but they do manage to grow okay. Damask roses, now we've all heard, of course, of autumn damask. Autumn damask is still grown throughout the Middle East and in Southern Europe uh, for its scent. It's the rose that is used uh, to scent everything that's rose flavored. 
um, and it is grown in fields specifically for that purpose. It's called autumn damask because it does have some repeat bloom in the fall, but it is mostly uh, grown in the spring. The interesting thing about this one is another rose that traveled. This rose grew up and was found in the Middle East and brought back in the 12th and 13th century by crusaders. They didn't just bring home what they considered treasure. They brought home roses. They brought home all sorts of other things. Uh, it's upright, thorny, and has arching canes. It tends to grow like this. It's very prickly. If you're going to prune it, I advise wearing chamois shirts. <laughs> it has a powerful, sweet fragrance. You can lose yourself or get high on one of those blossoms. Large blossoms, and they're about so big, uh, in few flowered clusters. It depends on how healthy the rose is, how big the blossoms are, but they're generally quite pretty. They do have some repeat bloom in the fall, but it's pretty minor. Alba roses, for those of you who studied Latin, are white. This is Alba semiplena, a, um, a close to a species, um, and it is typical of the, of the Albas. It's closely related to the European species Rosa canina. Uh, the Romans grew these for medicinal and cultural uses. There are some frescoes in, Ro in Italy that show rose petals being strewn on the floor for... Uh, for a banquet and that sort of thing. They used, aroma da uh, they used autumn damask and they used this rose as well. Uh, it is once blooming, it will grow in shade. So if you've got something, in a, a tree in the yard and you want something bright underneath it, this rose will do very well for you. It's white or pale pink in small clusters. It has a nice sweet scent, a very rosy, flowery scent rather than fruity or anything else. Centifolia roses, again, for those of you who took Latin, means that it has 100 petals. Uh, and if you took this rose apart and counted, you would find it has somewhere right around 100 or 120 petals. That's a lot of petals. And they're all crammed in. Some of these are quartered. Some of these are just kind of informal, like this one. Uh, they are once blooming. They're richly scented. Again, you can get lost in the scent of these roses. They are thorny canes, and they're generally f flopping around. So they need some kind of support to grow. Colors range from white to deep rose red, plus uh, very different kinds of striped and spotted and all kinds of things. You may have gathered from this that the roses that I like the best are the ones that are on the plants in the garden. I tend not to cut them unless I have a reason to do so. But for the most part, I like to see the plant and the rose in the garden. And these are absolutely amazing, some of the centifolia roses. Moss roses. Uh, will produce uh, these little glandular glabrous structures uh, around the buds and um, before the plant blooms uh, in this area. They're, it's really visible. Um, and when you, when you touch it, uh, the oil that's in those glands will stick to your hands. It has, there are various flavors, um, various flavors, uh, <laughs> various scents, uh, musky, mu a myrrh kind of a scent, uh, spicy scents. This particular one is, um, uh, Quatre Sassoon Blanc Mousseau is the name of the rose. And uh, this is a uh, spontaneous mutation which hybridizers have taken advantage of. Uh, many of these are once blooming. Some of them do repeat in the fall. This one does. Um, and this is the blossom uh, on the same plant. If you look under in that photo, if you look under the blossom, you'll see some of the mossy structures there. But the blossom is about so. Moss roses are really kind of interesting. Then there's the Chinas. Now these come not just from China, but China, Japan, Korea, and other places in Asia's, a Asia. And China roses are really kind of interesting because they brought some things into the hybridization process of Europe in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, specifically, they brought in colors that weren't, uh, were not known and the remontancy of continuous blooming. Uh, they are a little more delicate. They're, they don't stand the cold quite as much. They bloom continuously throughout the season. Uh, colors from deepest red, maroon, through pink to white. And they are ancestors of many roses, including some of the miniature roses. Bourbon roses were found on the Isle of Bourbon, or what was known as the Isle of Bourbon is now Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's, it's thought to be a natural cross between two roses that were, that were uh, naturalized there and that were growing out in, uh, in the wild. Uh, 
they have arching typical growth, except that there's a lot of a variety in these roses. So um, uh, their colors vary from red through pink to white, or this soft blush. I love the blushy colors. They're so subtle and so pretty. Hybrid perpetuals. This is a particular one, which was a found rose on the forest ranch, hence the name, forest ranch pom-pom. And the blossoms are kind of like pom-poms. It is a hybrid perpetual. It does repeat in the fall. And uh, a little bit, at any rate. Um, there are a wide variety of, of roses that fit into this category. It's sort of a clump-all category. Um, so the, the characteristics of them vary all over the map. The tea roses. This is one of my favorites. This is Lady Hillingdon. Um, the tea roses are named, nobody knows for sure, whether it's the fact that the roses sometimes have a scent which could be like tea, or that the boxes they were shipped in by the Dutch East India Company when they brought them to Europe were tea boxes. For one reason or another, they were named tea roses. And they originated in China. There are still some in the wild there. Uh, they are modest shrubs and climbers unless they're grown in California. And I put that caveat in there because there are tea roses in our cemetery higher than I am and um, maybe 15 feet wide. So um, they, can, they can do quite well. They have pointed buds. This is where when you look at the hybrid teas, the floribundas, the modern roses of today, you know, those long pointed buds, they come from the tea heritage. In the case of, of, of tea roses, the stems are weak at the, at the, right under the blossom, and they tend to nod. This is one of the reasons why I like to let the tea rose get up big so that when you're standing and looking up at it, you're looking into the blossoms. They're really quite nice that way. Put them on something that you can climb. This is where we get some of our yellows and our apricot colors. In the modern roses, they come from the teas. They are a little tender, and again, this added the tenderness to the hybrid tea, so that if you read a book on how to take care of your roses, and it was written by somebody in Minnesota, they're going to tell you how to pack them down in the winter and protect them in straw and do all that sort of thing. This fragility comes out of the tea part of the hybrid tea. And fortunately, in California, we don't have to do that, for which I am eternally grateful. And the Noisette, of course, is the only rose that was developed and hybridized in the United States. Uh, by a rice grower, of all things, a guy named Champney, and this is his first rose, Champney's Pink Cluster. Uh, they are Americans. The early ones were single bloomers. Uh, they really look great on a trellis or a fence. Uh, they climb beautifully. It looks just like a spill of, of flowers. Uh, the shades of white all the way through the crimson purples. Lightly fragrant for the most part. And these are some of those roses in our cemetery. I didn't take that one, okay? I stole that one from the web. This is one called Brandy, I think. These again, these are different kinds of roses in the cemetery. This is one of my favorites called Frau Tausenhofer. Hoffen, Tausenhofen, yeah. Um, and it has that wonderful pink in the center and an almost chartreuse around the outside edge. It's really a beautiful rose. Um, Yes, it has a wonderful scent, a uh, rosy kind of a, fruity kind of a scent. Uh, the, um, again, it, it's a tea, so it tends to grow really big like that, uh, like some of the others do. This is uh, Duchesse de Brabant, another tea. You can see the round shape and the flat across the rose, which is quite different from uh, some of the modern roses. This is my, one of my favorite groups of roses are hybrid musks. And this is a hybrid, I'm sorry, I passed it. That was a hybrid musk <laughs> called Cornelia, which is a very nice rose. And one of the reasons I like it is it will grow in part shape. This, of course, is Mademoiselle Cecile Bruner with its typical little button eye. This is Pearl d'Or, uh, another polyantha. Not really a polyantha, but we call it a polyantha. And these are some of the others. One of the things that we thought we ought to do, this is Alika, one of the things we thought we ought to do was to start collecting hi early hybrid teas in the cemetery. And so we do now collect those. And this uh, rose looks like a nice rose. Wouldn't you like to have that in your garden? It's beautiful. It has a it, uh, yellow bud opens to that salmon pink color, and it's really quite nice. 
This is a little rose called Fortune's Double Yellow. It's a china, so it can blooms continually. It's in full bloom right now. But this is what happens to it. <laughs> yeah, this photo was taken about four years ago. Uh, those headstones are all three feet high. So yeah, uh, it can get totally out of hand. That's a 20, uh, 20 by 20 foot plot, and you couldn't even see the headstones till we whacked it back a little bit. And now we have whacked it back much further because it will get out of hand. So you have to be careful when you buy something in the nursery, read all the small print. So let's take a look at some of the modern roses that we have collected in our cemetery. Again, the first offering of hybrid teas was 1867. That number, that year sort of sticks in our heads. Um, it was the dominant rose of the 20th century. It's the rose that, that the American Rose Society uh, uh, encouraged its, its members to grow and show. And uh, it, the hybridizers bred hundreds and thousands of different ones. They came and they went. Popularity is sort of like hairstyles and shoe styles. Um, once a rose was out of popularity, you couldn't find it anywhere. So one of the things that we thought we would do would be to um, plant some of the early hybrid teas that were grown at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. The hybrid tea combined the elegance of the tea roses, the color and everything, with the vigor of the hybrid perpetuals, who are much more cold resistant. Uh, and breeders continue to develop new kinds of roses, such as hybrid musk, multiflora, rugosis, polyanthus, David Austin roses, which is a whole talk in itself, um, and other modern types, miniature roses. Many of these are just called large flowered roses or large flowered climbers, um, but we prefer to, wherever possible, identify the heritage of that rose so that we know how to grow it and how it will grow. The old hybrid teas have a variety of different shapes and forms, but you can recognize them as hybrid teas because of the high center of the blossom, for one thing. Uh, this is the first one that was offered commercially. This is La France. We have it in our cemetery because it is appropriate to have one um, that was the, the precursor to all the modern roses, and so um, we have that one grown. It was also grown by people who lived in Sacramento at the time. This is a 1950 rose that we're growing in the cemetery for the simple reason that it's on property donated to the city by Captain John Sutter. So we thought that was appropriate. I took this photo about two weeks ago. That plant is in full bloom right now. This is another rose that we grew just because. Uh, it has an old rose look to it. But does anyone know what it is? Sally Holmes, yes. One of my personal faves. I have one at home. I have one uh, in the cemetery. We have one in the community garden where I take care of a little rose garden there. Uh, and it's real easy to propagate, although you're not supposed to. And um, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> and it has an old rose look to it because of the, the single blossom, the apricot buds. And in Sacramento, it tends to turn completely white when the blossom opens because of the sun and the heat. But uh, when it gets caught in the rain, it has this lovely peachy apricotty kind of look about it. It's pretty under any circumstances, I think. I love that rose. Pruning it is a pain in the neck because, of course, it has the biggest prickles and, well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> so what do we look for and what can you see in the cemetery garden at different times of the year? You see uh, in the spring, you see the new growth come out. We have a lot of color in the spring, even before the first roses bloom. Our earliest roses that bloom are the Banksias. And they will start blooming in uh, even late February. This year, we had a few blossoms in late February, and then they bloom throughout March. Um, and there are other single blooming roses that bloom later in the season. So we have blossoms um, throughout the year. And I know a lot of people don't like to grow roses that only bloom once, but if you plant them among other plants that, that bloom, uh, whether it's bulbs or other roses, you will always have something in bloom. And some of those once blooming roses have wonderful foliage or hips uh, that make it worthwhile to put the plant in the garden. Uh, in the summertime, we have flushes of blooms. All the spring ones are done, uh, but they are continuous in the more, uh, and then the chinas and the, and the teas and the, the more modern plants that we have. In the fall, we have hips and foliage colors and a last flush of flowers. And if you notice that 
when you have that autumn flush, the colors are deeper and truer, and the scent, if there is any scent, is stronger. In the winter, um, most plants will defoliate themselves. There are some that we force into dormancy just to give them a rest. We don't do it every year, but we do it once in a while just to make sure they get a little chance to, to take it easy. This is what the cemetery looks like in the fall. That's a bald cypress in the center and a number of, of locust, um, black locust. No, not black locust. Sorry? No. Um, they're locust trees of some sort or another. Um, and then there are some pistache chinensis in there too. Chinensis? Chinensi? Anyway. Uh, these are hips. So even in the wintertime, in the rain, it looks pretty cool. This is one rose that was found over near Merritt College. Um, it now has a, a real name, and that escapes me. I still think of it as Merritt College Noisette. Um, and it is covered in hips. This is Rosa canina in August, believe it or not. It gets, it gets hips very early. And on the species roses like this, we allow the hips to grow because it's absolutely beautiful in the fall. This is Rosa Roxburghii, really interesting hips. And then in the, in the wintertime, we get some interesting structures. This is a colonizing rose whose name totally escapes me. Uh, but it's even interesting in the wintertime. Uh, and of course, this is what we do in the wintertime. Um, we finished uh, pruning our, our uh, once bloomers. We prune in the spring, late spring and summer. In the wintertime, we prune virtually everything else. Now with 500 roses, we don't get to everything every year but we come close. We conduct pruning classes, and I have a few handouts up here uh, with a bookmark that lists the dates of our pruning classes and clinics, if you're interested. Uh, in the fall and in the winter, we have lots of color. This is Rosa Cinnamomea. Uh, the roses that we plant uh, have to be able to take the heat and full sun because in Sacramento, of course, as you know, it gets rather warm in the summertime. Uh, we use organic fertilizer sometimes in early spring and again after the flowering begins. We do not use uh, chemical stuff at all. Um, most of our roses get between five and six hours of sunlight, which is sufficient. We have a few that are perked under elm trees that get less light, but um, they still do okay. Uh, we prune our uh, repeat bloomers in late winter um, or after they're finished blooming for the single bloomers. Uh, we. You may have noticed the photos of the cemetery. It's like gardening with raised beds. Uh, so our drainage is really pretty good. Also, in a cemetery, uh, especially one that is as old as the 19th century, uh, things decay underground after time, especially wooden caskets, that sort of thing. So drainage is really not an issue for us. Water is, however, an issue from us. We use bubblers uh, in an irrigation system that is problematic because the pipes that come into the cemetery from the city water street, from the street, uh, are probably 100 years old now and they're not up to snuff. So we have to be very careful about how we water. We can't water the whole garden at once, for example. Uh, roses generally prefer 10 to 12 inches of organic matter and we try, that's our most important thing we do is that we will use compost to give them that. We mulch uh, to protect and discourage disease. If something really bad happens, we'll remove the rose, but generally speaking, we can recover from almost anything. This year, we had a lot of problems with rust uh, and we tried mechanically taking care of it. Uh, there was a, a, a tea rose and I pruned it down like I would in the winter time. We sprayed the rust off. I had, I had rust all over my clothes. It was really bad. This thing looked like orange from a distance. And that rose within three weeks was, was leafed out and completely rust free. And the other thing we did was we sanitized it. Um, I sprayed it with the same clipper side that I use on my clippers just to keep any rust from coming back. And that seemed to do the trick. It's beautiful now. I use a uh, Fizant. One of the, we have, we, we don't use um, um, pesticides and any of the rest of that stuff. So one of the things we do is we sanitize all our tools between every rose that we prune or work on.
Okay. Okay. Uh, I was asked what we use uh, to sanitize our clippers. We have as many opinions about that as we have people with clippers. And uh, I use something called Fizan, which is a um, uh, diluted with water. It's a, what's the word I want? Well, it is an antiseptic. It's a clipper side. It, it is an antiseptic for all sorts of things in the garden. P-H-Y-S-A-N. Yes, it's a disinfectant. It's concentrated. That's what I was trying to think of. It's concentrated. So you mix it with water, put it in a spray bottle, and then there are others who believe that the thing to do is to put a 1% solution of bleach and use that, but it tends to rust your, your pruners and stuff out. Lysol works, um, and dish soap would work because what dish soap does is it gets things to adhere either to the plant or the clippers. But there are some roses that are so sick that we will, use, uh, we will use two pruners and clean them between every cut. That way we don't spread whatever it is we're trying to, to get rid of from elsewhere on the rose or from rose to rose. Uh, there are people who believe that you ought to carry a jar of whatever it is you use and stick the clippers in and let them sit for 10 minutes and then use them. But I just spray my clippers and uh, then wipe them down and Defoliating. Well, that's what I did with the rose with the rust all over it. But after I finished pruning and defoliating it, then I sprayed it with a hard spray of water to get the rust off the plant. And then I also sprayed it with, with yeah, and, and yeah, leached it out of the soil. So the stuff you use is like the, the stuff I use is something called Fizan, P-H-Y-S-A-N. You can, and that's just one of a number of products. You can buy it at a nursery. It's specifically designed for, for, for uh, sanitizing tools and things you use in the garden. Uh, the other thing that I will do is if I'm concerned about spreading disease or anything like that is the minute I get home before I get in the house, strip all my clothes off in the garage and run in and take a shower. And that way then when I go, because I work in three or four different gardens, I don't take something from one garden and bring it to the other. My husband looks at me like I'm nuts, but hey, I want to err on the side of caution rather than bringing a disease. Okay, I'm running close on time here, but isn't this pretty? These are some of the pictures in the rose garden and in the, in the cemetery. These are some of the modern roses in the um, uh, perennial garden. We have an open garden every spring, and here we are setting up for our sale. We sell between five and 600 roses, and hopefully we will be able to continue doing that. We propagate roses from our own collection. However, the light brown apple moth quarantine is heading our way, and when that hits, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to continue our sales. Uh, we have a silent auction. We have a, a, a number of lots of interesting things at our open garden. Our next open garden is April 16th. And again, it's on the little bookmark that I have here for you. Uh, we had over 500 people last year. People come literally by the bus load to come and see us. So we're real pleased. We, but we turn it into a two-day event. Our event is on Saturday, but then on Sunday, we all get out there, have a cup of coffee and something to munch, and sit and talk among ourselves about the roses. These are some of the volunteers at the Rose Garden spending the Sunday morning just talking about roses. And we're so busy with the event, we don't get a chance to really walk the garden and look at it. Uh, these are, again, some of the roses in the cemetery. And we have a website. Uh, it, it's also on the bookmark. Uh, we are having a little difficulty with the website right now. If you try to search it through Google, you'll get, um, you won't get there. But if you put the URL in up above or you s go through Bing or another search engine, you'll find it just fine. Google has a problem with us, and I don't know why. Yeah. Yes, we have complete tags on the specimens. They, they tell when they were planted, um, when they were, gr well, when the tag was put on the rose. When the rose was um, planted originally, such as, you know, 1867 or whatever, it's, you know, it happens to be La France, it would say 1867, it would list the hybridizer if there is one. It would list the type of rose and the name of the rose. And those tags are tied onto the roses so that they do stay. They are actually there. Sometimes we have several tags per rose. Yes, that's true. Um, the website uh, has all the information. We have an upcoming event. Carolyn Parker of R is for Rose is going to speak next month. And um, the information about that presentation she's going to talk on, on uh, flower arranging is, uh, is on our website, as are the registration forms for that. Um, we try to keep up with what's happening in the Rose Garden. All the newsletters are also posted on the website. 
So I think that's about it. And I will, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes. Thank you. Yes and no. Uh, yes, there are a number. There are a number of, of commercial publications that do that. Uh, there are three master gardeners from uh, Calaveras County who came up with uh, a what they refer to as a field report, which is a two-page uh, form you can fill out that you measure everything: the size, shape, and color of the prickles, the how far apart the nodes are, uh, the shape of the stipules, everything about the rows. And then you make comparisons. And we do those field reports um, on, we, we did them, for instance, on Pearl and Vina, just so that we could actually compare the two roses in detail. Because if you look at a rose, you think, oh, that looks the same as the one over there. OK, we're good. But if you really look at the details, then you will know that, yeah, that rose has a different shape or color leaf or whatever it happens to be. So yeah, there is and there isn't. What's happening now is the beginnings of DNA searching. But the priorities for rose DNA are you know, way down near the basement someplace. The priorities for human being DNA and for diseases and that sort of thing is much, much higher. So any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. Well, there's a number of, of ways it can be done. There is a website called Help Me Find, which focuses on peonies, clematis, and roses. And the number of antique roses are there and photographed and identified. There are a number of contributors to that website, which um, uh, it, photographically or horticulturally. Um, and then the, the sellers uh, and purveyors of antique roses, such as Antique Rose Emporium in Brenham, Texas, or Vintage Gardens up in Sebastopol, um, the, those people know their roses very, very well. And again, you may come up with more than one opinion, but they will be happy to help you. Now, if you bring a rose to us at the garden and we're there, we will look at it and give you a pretty good idea, but we won't be definitive. I mean, we can't be definitive. We know a lot, but we don't know it all. No, we can't have them all. We only have 500, and that's good enough for us. Yes. I have one photo, but we haven't yet uploaded it. I need, I need to do some work on the website. One, the, the, our priority is to get the catalog onto the website. Right now, we have a non-searchable version on the website listing all our roses by type, by name, by location, and so forth. But we'd like to make that searchable, and so we're looking into doing that first. Yes? It's not very much of an issue for us. I mention it because it just so happens we dug one out last week, and that's like the first one in quite a while. Um, but there are, but because we don't spray and we don't do anything, occasionally we do. And some roses are more prone to it than, than others, but it's, it's a pretty small issue for us. The biggest issue for us uh, this year was rust in the spring. Uh, we had a lot of roses that got rusty. And um, then we had a little, like last summer, we had some trouble with spider mites. But again, we just sprayed them and they went away. I think our biggest problem is with invasive grasses, nutgrass. Bermuda, that sort of thing. Because we don't use Roundup, we don't use any of that, any stuff like that. Um, well, I shouldn't say we don't use Roundup. Maybe in a pathway or on a street, but not where the roses are. So um, occasionally, you know, we have problems with those kinds of grasses and things. I know I'm, I'm out of time, so uh, I appreciate your time. I'm glad you all came this morning. Thank you.